Well, welcome um, to um, the Stockholm World Water Week at Home. Um, very glad to have um, people participating and we were very happy to be able to, to run the program. Um, I'm Joan Rose, um, I'm a professor at Michigan State University and um, I've been on the program committee and really pleased to be here to, uh, uh, to kind of um, host this session on evading food and water crises in the COVID area. Arturo, um, please say hello to everyone and introduce yourself. Arturo Salavar, Salavar is, our, um, is our young professional who's been helping us uh, with the sessions. And um, he has a few um, uh, guidance uh, to help the session run smoothly. So good evening, everyone. So evening from here, uh, I'm in Mauritius currently. Um, so. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm excited um, for the coming minutes. Um, well, uh, I am. Uh, I will be taking notes uh, along the, the seminar, and please, I would like to to say from which country you are joining us, also to tell us um, your name and your affiliation, so we will keep record of uh, who are visiting us in in, in our seminar. So. I'm looking forward for these 45 minutes and hearing you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so if you'll just use the chat, um, then we'll have a record of who attended and um, add that information and Arturo will be writing up a small report. Um, please also use the chat for any comments or questions as we go along. Um, we'll be very happy to um, or hoping that the agenda goes smoothly and quickly and um, we have some time for some discussion and, and questions after each presentation. So with further, without further ado, we'll get going. Uh, this is our agenda. Um, I'm going to do a very quick introduction. Um, we're going to have our colleagues from the FAO then uh, present some of the, the key issues um, that they're dealing with. Um, and um, they put out some recent reports too, so we might be able to add those to our report and, or in the chat, the link to some of the reports that are um, uh, of interest. Uh, we will then have the World Health Organization talk about what they were doing and we'll have some final comments. Um, so, you know, we're all here virtually because we're in a pandemic. The, the virus, um, the coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2 is part of a family of viruses that has a, um, an RNA, a nucleic acid, and it's unique. Um, the coronaviridae family has an envelope layer with glycoproteins. I think this virus is, is the most um, well-known virus by the public because we see it on the television with all the spikes on it. Mm -hmm. um, but this, the, this group of viruses is found in a lot of humans and animals. And um, the first uh, common cold uh, coronavirus was uh, actually identified in 1932. Of course, we've had several other global outbreaks um, uh, from viruses in this family. The SARS, um, which uh, occurred in 2003, and then MERS. Um, and um, uh, these are still, some of this disease is still with us. It didn't, these um, viruses didn't uh, spread uh, as globally and as quickly as this one has. Um, we always watch the John Hopkins uh, Resource Center to look at what's happening. This is some of the data on confirmed new cases around the world. You can see that we're we had a small um, increase. Um, we have a lot of people in the United States. Uh, we sort of leveled off. And then um, as we opened back up, we had um, a very high increase in cases in other parts of the United States. The first part of it was in New York. And the second part of this increase, you know, has been occurring in, in many states um, around the U.S. Um, you can see that Brazil also has been struggling. India has been struggling with these increases. And many other countries, while they had some devastating increases early on, have been able to 
um, bring this um, uh, to, to uh, a more steady state, but we are seeing these second waves. There's a lot of concern about the fall coming up because of the flu season, and then this virus might overlap with that. Now we found out that this um, virus likes to infect a lot of different organs in the body, and this is related to some of the disease that we're seeing. Of course, this pneumonia um, and inability, you know, to, to breathe, um, hospital, high hospitalization rates and mortality rates associated with its uh, colonization of the lungs. But we also found that it colonized the intestinal tract. And in fact, we um, now know that this virus excreted in feces and it ends up in wastewater. Um, for those of us, and I'm an environmental microbiologist, I didn't actually introduce myself except that I'm from Michigan State University. I'm an environmental virologist and public health microbiologist. I study organisms that are spread through water. Um, while we don't believe SARS is, a water is waterborne, some of the methods we've used are uh, we're using now to detect this virus in wastewater. We now have 40 published studies around the world um uh, that are looking at, at uh, the occurrence of the virus in wastewater and as you can see the work in amsterdam by my colleague dr gurten gurten up uh, metama um, uh, was able to provide early warning um, that is um, a look into the community infection um, understanding the cases before you know before um, uh, it uh, was observed in the community so the goal is whether we can use uh, COVID monitoring wastewater around the world to help understand the disease in our communities. Um, we see that we do need to have more monitoring um, in certain parts of Africa, uh, but this is um, um, quickly becoming a, a sort of a, a shared network um, approach to try to uh, get coverage of understanding the disease and how fast it's it's transmitting. Of course, this disease has disrupted our essential services. Um, and um, of course, access to safe water and access to food um, uh, is seen as essential. Um, and um, how do we handle all of this in various parts of the world um, as the, the disease moves into our communities? And I think this is what our distinguished speakers are going to present. So we're going to have the FAO present next and the WHO. Uh, secondly, we'll end with, um, I guess, a few closing words. Um, so I, I would like to... Um, give you a quick introduction uh, to our speakers. Um, we've got Patricia Mears, who's with the FAO. She specializes in land and, and, and water, um, uh, works in that division. And she's an agricultural engineer, and she has 15 years experience in improving access and management of water and agriculture, and addressing food security and poverty reduction. Um, you know, Patricia, you, you work all over the world. Um, it, it's really amazing. And so we're, we're really looking forward to your insights on um, the, how this is disrupted or maybe even enhanced your programs, this whole issue of a global pandemic. Um, her, car, her, her colleague, um, Marlos, is, uh, um, is in the Water Resources Management um, uh, Program. Um, he's uh, come from Australia, he's gotten his degrees in Australia, worked in Brazil, um, you know, joined uh, um, the um, FAO in 2015. Um, and again, he's um, uh, leading a team on integrated nexus of, of water management for um, food security. Um, and 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 Marlos, I was really um, interested that you you know link that whole idea of management at the watershed scale to what we do on the land, and you have a lot of experience with that. Um, 
So our final speaker will be Kate Metalcott from the World Health Organization. She is a team leader of the Sanitation and Wastewater or WASH um, group. Uh, she works in Geneva, but I know that she goes all over the world as well. Um, she's been translating um, evidence into policy and practice. She's been developing guidelines. Uh, she's been working with the health sector, the sanitation sector, and sort of merging that. Um, and Kate, how long have you been with, uh, I wasn't sure how long you've been with WHO, but I know you've You've been there helping their guidelines for, you know, um, the last five yeah. years. So I've yeah. been uh, coming up to eight years in Geneva and three years. In the eight years. Okay. I knew you'd been there quite a bit of time helping with the guidelines. And now all of a sudden you're dealing with this, this pandemic. So I'm going to stop here. Um, uh, I guess, Patricia, if you'll share your, your screen, I'm going to give over the floor to you. Okay. So thank you, John, and, and good morning or good afternoon to, to all the participants. I'm gonna share my screen so I can show the presentation. So I, I, I hope it's visible. Can you, can you see it? Okay. Yes, it looks great. Okay, so, uh, we are going to talk about the COVID impact in, in the food crisis, and also which are the, the responses that FAO is, is, is preparing from, from the water sector in rural areas. Um, many of you maybe know that the, the number of people suffering from, from hunger has been increasing in the last years. And, and the COVID crisis is is um, aggravating, you know, deepening this, this crisis and the number of, of hungry people. So in, in our presentation, uh, I'm going to, to, to show the latest estimates on the number of food insecurity and the impacts of, of COVID, talking about two, two, two reports from, from FAO and, and other partners. And then my colleague, Marlos de Sousa, is going to talk about what are the solutions um, that may come from, from the water sector in, in agriculture. Um, so I'm going to talk first about um, a report that many of you may know. It's um, uh, the, state, the, the report on the state of food security and malnutrition in the world, also known as SOFI. This is a very important report for FAO. Uh, which is elaborated with other uh, four UN agencies uh, such as WHO, IFA, WP, and, and UNICEF. So in July uh, 2020, um, we launched this report and, and, and the numbers uh, were analyzed before the crisis of COVID. And I'm going to present which, which are the, the, the key messages. So the first message is that the war hunger is still increasing. As I, as I said, the number of people affected by hunger has been on a rise since 2014. So in 2019, uh, there were nearly 690 million people hungry. So uh, that represents 9% of the world population. It also means that in one, in one year, um, the population suffering from, from hunger um, has, has risen up by 10 million people in one year and by nearly 60 million in five years. Um, if, we, if we look at the regional perspective, um, uh, this number is highest in, in, in Asia with 381 million uh, hungry and it's rising, rising very fast in Africa. No, with uh, 250 million hungry. So as a conclusion, the work is not on track to achieve zero hunger by 2030. And, and this report also provides some projections that say that if the, if the trends continue, the number of people affected by hunger will surpass 840 million by 2030. 
and, and, and with Africa overtaking Asia as the region most affected by food insecurity and, and hunger. So these are the figures before COVID. So, and we can see that these are alarming figures and, and we see that the, that the world hunger is, is increasing um, every year. But also beyond hunger, uh, the, the report uh, says that over 2 billion people do not have regular access to safe nutrition and sufficient food. So the world is not on track also when we talk about malnutrition. And while there, is, there has been some progress in, in child stunting and breastfeeding, child overweight is, is not improving and adult obesity um, is rising. Uh, so these are the figures before COVID and the report also gives some projections on, on what will be the impact of COVID-19. So the, um, there have been some analysis on the impact of COVID in, 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 in food security. So they've been analyzing different scenarios, uh, taking into account uh, the GDP decrease in different countries. So the analysis says that, that the COVID pandemic may add as many as 132 million people to the total number of hungry only in 2020. And also the nutritional status of the most vulnerable is likely to deteriorate further due to COVID-19. So we are uh, in a very serious situation where a lot of people um, are, are vulnerable to, to food insecurity. Um, I would like to say that the, the data that are provided by, by Sophie are, are the data that relates to chronic food insecurity. That means the long-term difficulties for people to access food. But uh, there is another report that was also launched in, in July, uh, a joint report by FAO and WFP, which looks more at the emergency situation. It's a, it's, it's a report on early warning analysis of acute food insecurity. So it, it has looked at the countries which are more vulnerable, which are more at risk of suffering from, from acute hunger. And if you see the map, this is the result of the, of the analysis that has been done. You see, you see in the map uh, the countries in red, which means that are uh, hotspots countries, which were probably there will be a, a, a high number of people suffering from, from acute from food insecurity. Uh, we see very clearly that Africa is the region which has the largest um, uh, vulnerable countries, but there is also uh, some red countries in, in Latin America and Asia and, and the Middle East. Um, uh, um, another important thing uh, is that the SOFI and this early warning report uh, analyzes which are the main drivers for, for this vulnerability. One main driver is the conflict, another is the economic downturn, but the third driver, which is very important, is the access to water. So, so the changes in the climate, the, the dry spells. This is a very important driver uh, that makes countries very vulnerable to food security. And this is why we think that the water sector and, and improving the water management is key in the response for, for COVID-19. So now I'm going to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Marlos, who's going to talk about which programs uh, may be uh, in place in the different countries uh, to, as a solution for COVID from the water sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patricia. And um, good evening or good morning or good night for everyone. So COVID is giving us a chance of opening the doors for um, a lot of people to attend the World Water Week that usually yeah, you don't have the opportunity to travel all the way to Stockholm to participate. So this year, I'd say because of the COVID, we are um, more integrated in this regard. So I think Patricia gave um, some numbers of what's going on and the impact of, of COVID. One thing we have been discussing a lot internally and usually I discuss it with a number of people in terms of the importance of water for agriculture. So I sometimes make a joke with my colleagues from the soil part of, of FAO's business saying that we can produce 
food without soil, but there is no way of producing food without water. So water has been, you know, central to our discussion here. So the previous, the previous slide, we had what we produced or we um, launched during the first months of or the first months of the COVID-19 impact is a policy brief uh, by FAO that was led by our, our division in terms of integrates agricultural water management and health. So the point we are discussing here is really to incorporate the water management into this process of protecting health, but not just the health of people, the health of animals and the health of the environment. So then in this regard, we came you know, with this new program at FAO called One Water, One Health, is where we are putting together this concept that usually people, they face the One Health concept. You are <laughs> extending it to One Water, One Health. The idea is really to integrate the whole management of water in a way that we do have this impact of water on health of people, animals, and the environment. So the recommendation we have here under this integrated um, agricultural water management and health or this new program of FAO is really how to manage water in a way that we can try to avoid future um, diseases to be spread or improve the resilience of those being impacted by by um, disease like the COVID-19 at the moment. So for a long time now, since we started the pandemic, we have heard a lot about washing our hands, but going around the globe to see that still 2.2 billion people, they don't have access to water to do it on a daily basis. So for us, really, it's a challenge of, you know, and a challenge to understand and how to incorporate those new things and how FAO, together with the member states, how we could help, you know, those countries, especially the ones left behind, for them really to face the pandemic and to be more resilient. So, Patricia, if you can go to the next one, please. To the next slide. Not working? <laughs> I may try to use mine here then. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. So in this regard, we developed a number of responses coming from the Land and Water Division. So we are, our mandate at FAO is to propose and to manage water in a way, you know, for um, implementing the mandate of the organization. So we launched um, a response coming from the Land and Water Division together with a response coming from different parts of FAO as well. It's not just about our division. We have several divisions from FAO that are doing exactly the same. You know, they prepared response for, for the pandemic, for what's going on at the moment around the globe. And what you have in front of you is the response prepared by the Land and Water Division from our division. So you go to the left there, we have a number of um, programs that we launched during this period to help countries to be more resilient to the problems they were facing. From home gardens, for example, for composting, of solar powered energy for, for irrigation schemes and so on. But then today it says we do have a very, you know, limited time for us to go through. I select two that I think gonna go very well to do with the discussions today. So one is the circular economy and how it applies for waste to resource and the COVID-19 pandemic. And the second one is about water quality and food safety and COVID-19. So the first one, when we're talking about circular economy, I think for most of you, it's not you know, something new. So we have heard about this, this concept before the discussions and how to implement it, especially in the cities. And however, here, what we have been proposing to countries and uh, to member states is really to understand that we can apply the same circular economy for agriculture at the farm level, that they can be more resilient to the problems they are facing now. So I don't know if you know most of you have been following up what's going on with farmers, for example. Some of them that have been heavily impacted with the logistics 
of moving production out of the gate from what they have been producing to take the production to come and to reach us in the cities for us to be um, able to buy food, for example. And some of those that they have been heavily impacted by logistics because they cannot import inputs that they need for um, the everyday of farming, for example, fertilizers. So I was uh, chatting with a friend of mine in Brazil that he told me about what's going on there in one state in Brazil that they used to export most, uh, almost the whole production of, of uh, uh, melons to Europe. But they have all to be um, moved from Brazil to Europe by airplanes with the COVID-19 and stopping almost 100% of the aviation industry. They couldn't move it out from the country. So producers, they had a big production on their hands and they were heavily impacted by, um, by logistics. So on the other hand, as I said, some others, they, they need fertilizer for um, keep cropping and they couldn't get their hands on fertilizer. They have been impacted by a lack of energy and some other things. So the idea of implementing the circular economy at this level is that farmers, you know, and urban and peri-urban agriculture, they can use those resources that usually we produce, not just at a farm level, but at a city level as well. So to reuse treated waste water in agriculture, for example, or to reuse manure that's produced in livestock uh, enterprise globally, that nowadays they are not treated or not reused in, the, in, a safe, in a way that can be safe to the environment, safe for those that they are touching or managing um, manure as, as a biofertilizer. So the whole idea we are proposing here for member states is really to use circular economy in two different scales, the city scale as well as to move it at a farm scale to help farmers to be more resilient. Most of the farmers, they really, if they apply the circular economy approach, they will be able really to be more resilient in, term, in times of crisis. So, and the second one, that I was talking before is about water quality and health. So most have been said about the impacts of agriculture on water quality. So even for FAO recently, you know, I think it was last year or two years ago, we launched during the World Water Week, we launched another publication talking about the impact of agriculture on water quality. But not a lot of people, they discuss the impacts of water quality on agriculture and the, how those impacts, they can translate you know, to impacts on the health of people, the health of animals and the health of the environment. So nowadays what we have been um, flagging and this program of water quality and health is trying to achieve is to really to manage both to manage the source of pollution coming from agriculture and getting to the environment. So there you can see one of the latest publications between FAO, WHO and OIE in terms of antimicrobial resistance and how antimicrobial resistance moving from you know, a case in agricultural area or agricultural land, getting to the environment, they can really be a problem for human health and animal health. So creating the super bacteria that in the future won't be able to treat is a big problem. So in this regard, we are trying working together with other organizations like WHO and OIE in terms of preparing guidance and helping countries to understand the impact they have in those activities and how we can work together with you know, tailored um, solutions and actions they can take trying to mitigate and to avoid the problem all together. But as I said, we have impacts caused by water quality and agriculture as well. Per se, for livestock, for example, livestock, they can um, lose up to 25% in weight for the beef industry because of bad water quality. So it's just one impact that they may have in animals and they can have in the business of uh, the beef industry. So, but it goes on. So what we have been working now and um, is new program area of FAO, is to work from the source to the fork, as what we have been calling it. So the source where we do have the water quality being used by um, farmers for different reasons, for irrigation, for example, or for livestock. 
and how this quality of water can impact the whole chain of food production. You know, coming from where it has been produced to go through all the process of being processed by the industry or getting to markets to be sold at markets. So in all of those elements, we're gonna see that water has a role to play in this process. So in this regard, we have been working several ways to understand the impact of water quality on agriculture, on food production and food safety. One is by understanding, for example, using now uh, genome tracking for us to understand the movement from you know, pathogens from water becoming coming from waterborne disease to become probably foodborne disease. And from there to be going all the way through the food chain to get to other place and provoke you know, uh, health issues. Um, to some nuclear techniques to understand how AMI is moving through uh, the environment and getting to agricultural areas and causing problems as well for livestock or for aquaculture or fisheries. So it's another technique that we are planning to apply and help countries to understand in this way of doing surveillance where the problem is and how they can manage it. So I think for the time being, I think I'm going to talk here for us to have a discussion, but thank you very much for the time and look forward for the discussion. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. I, I think there was um, just, you know, one comment in the chat and it was about the scale of the impact on food, food security and, and, and this increase in, um, you know, millions of people that are going hungry uh, versus water. Um, especially mm -hmm. under this this COVID, you know, under the the pandemic, and it does seem like maybe the food chain, the food supply chain, is more susceptible to disruption. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think for I, you know, Patricia can complement as well. But from what we have been um, looking at from contacts we have in countries and exchanging ideas of what's going on, discussing what's going on at the moment with, with our counterparts. You see, as the example I used before, the impact on logistics. So as they cannot export the food they have, and even if they do have the logistics of getting to the port, so they need to get ships to go there and to collect the food and to transport it from one port to another one. When you get to another port, we have all the restrictions from the receiving port. So they have maybe to go to quarantine and other things. And then after you have to move it by land. So they have been heavily impacted. And I think some countries that they need to import most of their food are the most impacted ones. Right. So the ones they are producing more, for example, the example I, I used before from Brazil. So the problem they have now is for some farmers where to put the product, the produce they have, they cannot sell it. You know, they, they want to be able to yeah. Right, so it, it disrupts their their economy as well. Absolutely. It seems yes. like, Patricia, those that have local mm. capabilities are, have some resilience under this pandemic. Yeah, I mean, we, we have to look at the, the two sides. No, one is also the production side that will be affected by the lack of inputs or the lack of market accessibility, but also from the other side that a lot of people are losing their jobs and, and, and inform, I mean, for, for poor people, they, they depend on informal um, jobs. So they have less, less power to, to buy food no? and nutritious food mm -hmm. in, in general. And, and we have also to think about the migrants, no? all, the, all the displaced people, no? that they cannot move now. They, they have restrictions to move across the borders. Uh, that yeah. that has also been a, a big impact for agriculture because they yeah, they're not able to work. migrants for for the work in agriculture. You know? so yeah, are, that's certainly been um, yeah a, a very big deal even in the United States. Yeah, for sure. Well, I know we're running on on a timetable here, and I think um, I'll turn it over to Kate to uh, give her presentation from WHO, and then we'll have some final comments. Kate. We'll let you share your screen. Thank you, John. You can see that. Yes. Yes, we can. Indeed. Wonderful. Okay. So, yeah, um, I just want to give you uh, an overview of the the wash response to COVID, and then zoom in a bit on this issue of environmental surveillance. 
Okay, so just firstly on the figures, maybe you're all very familiar with this. We're coming up on 23, 24 million cases and over 800,000 deaths. Um, I think everybody's getting very tired of, of some of the control measures and, and less compliant with them. Um, but unfortunately, everything sort of points to this, this pandemic being, uh, being you know, far from over yet. So in terms of the response, there's three main guiding documents. You see them here. Um, and from, we're all kind of wash people on this call, I think, or, or water sector people, and perhaps the linkages with water are very obvious. I think from the, the uh, public health community who are you know, thinking about, about diagnostics, case finding, treatment options, vaccine development, some of the, the wash elements are not so obvious. So we really need to be making sure that we're making the case for wash. And you'll see now that it's included in these five ways within the key recommendations. So of course, you know, maintaining essential wash services, um, main, uh, allowing hand hygiene, especially for vulnerable households, and very much so in, in healthcare facilities, and making sure we're thinking not just about provision of facilities, but of course, behavior change. I think many of us uh, are guilty of having perfectly good hand washing facilities, but for whatever reasons, not uh, practicing that behavior. Um, so in terms of uh, where we're at with, with WASH, what is the kind of uh, ground we've landed on with this pandemic? Uh, again, I think many of you will be familiar with these, with these numbers. 30% uh, you know, without uh, safe water at home, 2 billion without even basic sanitation, 3 billion people without hand hygiene facilities at home. It's a really, really shocking number. Uh, and likewise, 42% of healthcare facilities don't have a hand hygiene facility at the point of care, which you know, really begs the question, can you even call it a health facility if you don't have that, that really basic means of infection prevention? And uh, the new schools report has just come out as well with the figures you see here. Um, you know, more than 40% of schools don't have basic hand hygiene facilities. So when we're thinking about coming out of lockdown and how we maintain sort of hygienic conditions that will prevent uh, transmission, there's some really big challenges there. And that, you know, that, among other reasons, is why we've uh, launched the Hand Hygiene for All initiative in, in June of this year. Uh, really looking at, at scaling up hand hygiene in all of these settings, healthcare facilities, workplaces, public places, uh, refugee camps, um, around, these, around these four kind of focal areas and, and a whole kind of whole of society engagement uh, with a lot of partners getting on board with that. Of course, because it's one of the most effective things that we can do to prevent COVID transmission, but also actually because it's been something that we've been rather shamefully neglecting in the WASH sector for, for some time and, and that really is reflected in those figures I just showed you. Um, so in terms of what we do on WASH for, for COVID, um, you know, naturally with a, with a new pathogen, there's a, there's a sense that, oh, do we need to do something really different? In fact, you know, based on what we know about, uh, about this virus, uh, nearly all of, well, in fact, all of our uh, guidance, existing guidance holds. So, of course, frequent hand hygiene, um, environmental cleaning using uh, disinfectants, um, the, the existing water and sanitation guidance, so for the drinking water quality and sanitation, but also really making sure that these wash investments are central to the overall response and recognizing that this isn't just a short-term wash response to COVID, but actually there's huge co-benefits for infectious disease of, of making these improvements. So, so we need to be thinking about um, uh, you know, long-term infrastructural enabling environment and behavior change uh, interventions. Okay, um, Joan sort of touched a bit on this, but I wanted to kind of talk a bit about what we know about um, the presence of the COVID virus in feces and infectivity, because I mean, this, this really uh, impacts a lot on the types of response options we choose, understandably. 
um, so it's a it's a enveloped virus, and, and quite often when you hear enveloped virus, you think, oh, that might be quite a tough virus. But in fact, it's quite fragile in the environment, and and becomes quite uh, quickly deactivated. Um, and uh, although we've, there's been uh, detections of uh, of the, the virus in feces, very few of them are active infective virus, most a, a very small percentage. So the risk of transmission from feces from an infected person is uh, appears to be very low. Um, likewise, when it comes to surfaces, the, the white um, ones you see here, those are uh, similar coronaviruses, and the last one is, is looking specifically at this virus with what we had previously known to be around two to nine hours survival time in the environment, but what seems to be emerging is that the kind of medium half-life of about uh, 1.2 hours, which is kind of worth re reflecting on in terms of how we respond, um, you know, holding up ships of food that have been at sea for, for a lot longer than that period is perhaps not a rational response to COVID control. So we, we really have to make sure we're putting our efforts into, into the things that are going to make a difference for transmission. Um, in terms of wastewater, again, so and while we're finding uh, these RNA within wastewater, with it hasn't been, infectious virus has not been de detected in uh, untreated or treated wastewater and likewise drinking water. So the risks of uh, transmission of COVID through drinking water, through feces, through sanitation systems is, uh, is, it was very low, um, which is not to say we shouldn't be doing all the things we need to do to make those systems safe anyway, but we shouldn't be worried about additional risk of COVID uh, and existing um, guidance applies. Um, but I wanted to sort of transition now to this work on uh, wastewater surveillance, which has really interesting potential to complement the, the wastewater surveillance. So picking up these, these RNA uh, uh, fragments in, in wastewater is, um, is a useful tool in the overall response. So getting to, to that topic now, there's, there's an awful lot happening in the space. The research is moving very fast, and I'm sure Joan will pull me up if anything I've said right here is, is, um, is, is out of date. But these are some of the, the key resources, if you're interested in it, and some of the key networks. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, summarize some of the key takeaways from the WHO scientific brief that was published uh, earlier this month. Um, so firstly, what you see here from the, the website I gave the link to um, is, is the many collaborations that are happening on this at, at the moment. Um, so this, it's a really global effort. It's, it's probably skewed, I would say, towards uh, higher income countries with higher sewage coverage, and, but there are some pilot work uh, underway in countries that have uh, a greater percentage of, um, of on-site sanitation services, which is kind of important methodologically and in terms of the interpretation of results. Um, so as I said, this is progressing really quickly and it's, uh, um, it's also been used in the polio eradication program very successfully and I, I hope you'll kind of join me in, in celebrating the huge success that was announced yesterday with the uh, eradication of, of um, wild polio in Africa. So, so these, these kind of environmental surveillance tools can have a very powerful role to play in, in disease control and elimination. Um, that said, for COVID, we're, we're kind of at the, the early stages, understandably. But what seems to be emerging as the ways that this can complement the response is, firstly, is an early warning, which, which Joan mentioned, maybe three to five days um, early warning. Um, uh, detection to in locations where there's lim limited clinical surveillance, so that would be... Um, <clears throat> not an alternative to clinical surveillance, but it may be a trigger to do more in-depth testing. I'm thinking of things like, like prisons, like informal camps, like isolation facilities and so forth. Um, monitoring of circulation in the, uh, in the community. There's some interesting 
but sort of inconclusive work that's been done on retrospective analysis and of course research for for its own um, for its own sake, which is also important for us to learn more. I'm trying to rush now because I see Joan has got her video on. Um, <laughs> Okay, but there's some considerations that we need to kind of uh, think about before this can really be put into practice. The first is representation, with the big thing being what do we do in, in countries with low sewer coverage. Coordination is absolutely key. We have to figure out how this complements the, the wider public health response. We need to be really clear about, you know, is this additional investment worthwhile? What's it telling us? And that needs some evaluation. Um, some legal and ethical considerations, but actually lower because the information is pulled. Um, and we need to work on quality assurance, so establishing um, protocols and uh, approaches that, are, that can be kind of standardised over time. Lastly, the point I wanted to finish on is on safety. I mean, there's, there's many kind of people out there in the uh, in, in practice, particularly sanitation workers, who hear of this work and, um, and maybe afraid that um, they may be going to, to catch COVID from wastewater because it's being detected in wastewater through this surveillance. So we need to be really clear with the public stakeholders uh, about the infection risk. Um, so thank you very much. Sorry, I took a little long. Back to you, Joan. No worries. Um, I didn't, um, let's see, we've got, um, one question for you. What are the roles of the wastewater management and water consultants in pr helping to prevent um, the disease transmission? Kate, have they, have they come together with a, you know, with an approach? I mean, you a mentioned consultant? access, access to water just to wash your hands, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I, mean, I think consultants are kind of working across the, the huge range of, of topics. So I'm not sure what you mean specifically, but but there's, there's a huge need for technical advice, both on, of, of all types, you know, on the behavior change, on the infrastructure development, around, around hand hygiene, around essential services, around the surveillance approach. And um, WHO works with a, a sort of a, a limited pool of consultants on, on various topics related to this. But our main investment in consultancy has been around the hand, hand hygiene initiative. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting how it's really shown a spotlight on, um, you know, that we need to we need to speed up what we're doing so that people actually have access to safe water. It's going to be important, and it's it's really shown, a, a, you know, there's a spotlight on that. And then not, I, not just I, for COVID, I would say, but um, you know, but for all pandemics, right? We we can't uh, we need to yeah. sort of a, a a response mode and be and be more prepared with these essential services for, for all infectious disease outbreaks. And and I think it's a challenge for both food security and water safety in, in these middle and low income countries and implementing surveillance and implementing you know strategies to to um, improve uh, resilience. Um, and I know we're running over but I, I would like to give everyone you know just um, you know, 30 seconds of your, your big take home message. Um, Marlos, uh, what's your, your big take home message to the group? Well, I think the big one for me and from my work here at FAO is that COVID is showing us that, you know, we, we need to be, to be or to become more resilient of ourselves you know, close to where we are, and especially to consume food that's produced nearby. So then at least we can diminish a lot, you know, the impacts we may have, and to learn how to, you know, to really to reuse everything we are producing in terms of waste nowadays, and to become resource that we can be more resilient when we do have impacts. Such the COVID that stops everything. Oh, so mm -hmm. this is my take. <laughs> yeah, Patricia. Yeah, I think um, after the presentation of the trends on food insecurity and the impact of COVID, I think it's clear that there is an urgent need to, to respond to these, to these challenges. 
So before COVID, the situation was already very alarming. Now the situation is, is, is even worse. And, and there are many countries that are very, very much vulnerable to, to food insecurity. Uh, we have al al also seen that Africa is particularly, the situation in Africa is particularly alarming. Um, uh, we, we've seen that the numbers are rising very quickly and that there are many countries which are hot spots. Hot, hot spots mm. no, for, 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 for acute food insecurity. So I think there are two, two pathways to, for the governments to add. One is the emergency, to respond to the emergency and to provide food, food assistance to, to people in vulnerable situations. But there is also another pathway which is important, which is um, to, to maintain and to, to increase the resilience of food systems. And for that, water management and water access and access to drinking water and sanitation, no? is really very important, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Patricia, very. And Kate, I'll give you the last word to give us your, your final thoughts. Well, I would just like to point out a milestone that's coming up. Global Hand Washing Day is on 15th of October. That gives you kind of six weeks to really think about what you can do in what, whatever capacity you're in to, to put a spotlight on hand hygiene, uh, start building hand hygiene into, into your programs, whether that's in communities, your workplaces, uh, public places, whether it's behavior change, technology, financing, all of those things are needed. It's a real all hands on deck kind of uh, situation for, for the wash sector. So take these next six weeks to, to plan how you can really make a splash on, on Global Hand Washing Day and, and beyond, of course. Thank you. Yes. And, and we should say um, congratulations to the world uh, for eradicating polio. That's amazing. And it's difficult to, to do anything like that. And here we are in this middle of a global phenomenon right now. And, and it's really been amazing to me how the global world and network, including, you know, um, you know platforms that, that Stockholm, uh, you know, provides has brought you know, uh, people together to try to solve this at the, at the global scale to help uh, the local, you know, help the local people. I have so. to finish with a final plug on sanitation though, because while that is an incredible achievement for, for polio, as long as we have uh, uh, poor sanitation systems, there's, there's a risk of, of a rebound of polio. So that's it's super important that we, we stay on that task. Yes, absolutely. Maybe we go, we focus more on getting that uh, SDG 6 on reuse for food <laughs> moving forward as well and then solve two problems at the same time. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining us um, and um, we'll have a report. We'll have this uh, seminar um, up on the website. So um, uh, enjoy the rest of the um, Stockholm World Water Week at home. And thanks for joining us.